Okay, now we're going to talk about nomothermia and the perianesthesia setting. Here are the objectives. Going to gain the knowledge of the physiolo physiology of thermal regulation, identify the negative consequences of hypothermia, identify patients at risk for hypothermia, and demonstrate techniques of monitoring patient temperature and interventions. So here we're going to talk about physiology of thermal regulation, how do we lose heat, and the negative consequences of hypothermia, and finally we'll talk about the monitoring and intervention. So let's talk about the definition of hypothermia. It is defined as core temperature less than 36 degrees Celsius. This is a very, very important number that you need to know. And 36 degrees Celsius or 96.8 Fahrenheit. You probably worked in the PACU before and you know your preceptor might be looking for the perfect number, at least 96.8, but is that the best practice? And we'll talk about that. So why are we talking about this? Unplanned perioperative hypothermia is a common consequence of general and regional anesthesia. It's extremely common and has some consequences. That's why we're gonna talk about this. So now let's first talk about the physiology of thermal regulation. How do we regulate heat? The core temperature of the body is tightly controlled within strict parameters for the effective function of many enzyme and transport mechanisms. It begins with the input from the cold sensors. It's in peripherally, it's on the skin, deep tissue, and we have some sensors and the central location as well, like your spinal cord, brain, brainstem, and hypothalamus. Hypothalamus often kind of pops up in the question of CPAN. So just know hypothalamus is responsible for your body heat regulation. So what does body do when we are cold? When we are cold, it causes vasoconstriction. Alpha-1 receptors are activated. It causes non-shivering thermal uh, genesis first, and then causes shivering, and we create heat that way. When we are hot, we, on the other hand, vasodilate, right? And we start sweating to reduce that heat, and your hypothalamus trigger that uh, cooling method. According to research, up to 20% of surgical patients experience unplanned hypothermia. So how do they lose heat? Let's talk about that. This often pops up in your CPAN question. So no, how do we lose heat and what the losing mechanisms are? 40% of heat are lost through radiation. What's radiation? That is your uncovered body parts. So think about your big belly case, right? We don't have them covered. Usually we don't have them on the warming blankets because we need the belly to be open, right? We lose heat that way. Or think about the babies. Their head is like, what, 50% of the body, right? And if we don't cover their head, they lose heat that way. So that's through radiation. 30% of heat is lost through convection. You might have a convection oven, oven in your house. It's that air movement. So if you ever been to like Chicago during the winter and in Chicago, the wind is so strong and you feel much colder than the actual temperature itself. Why? Because the air movement is making that temperature feel much, much colder. It's your wind chill factor. And if you ever walked in the OR before, it's so cold because the air is moving. The air exchange happening like 15 times an hour. That's much more than your normal house or your inpatient rooms. 25% of the heat is lost through evaporation. That is your surgical prep. Uh, that could be your from like sweat of the patient. And a um, patient who is mechanically ventilated, they lose heat that way too. 5% of the heat is lost through conduction. If you ever touch the OR table, that's so cold, right? And the skin prep and the IV fluid irrigation and the cold drapes, that's how they lose heat. Conduction, 5%, evaporation, 25%, convection, 30%, radiation, 
And I want you to appreciate this picture. So a patient who is under general anesthesia, they are vasodilated, right? So they lose heat that way too. And you look at that, all the heat is kind of centered around and the core of the normal patient. When they go under anesthesia, look at that area. So we lose heat that way, hugely that way too. So think about that. Okay, on top of that, many patients are getting regional anesthesia, right? Because, you know, that controls the pain and we have to give less narcotics. So a lot of patients are receiving regional anesthesia. It decreased the shivering and vasoconstriction effect. And so puts the patient at higher risk for heat loss during combined a general and regional anesthesia. And the children are at higher risk. Why? Because they have large body surface area, they have less adipose tissue and immature heat regulation capacity. So they are at high, high risk for hypothermia. So what are the other risk factors for unplanned perioperative hypothermia? Patients on ASA grade two to five, higher the grade, higher the risk, makes sense, right? Patients are usually sicker, they have a, a issue with a vasoconstriction. Uh, Pre-op temperature less than 36 degrees Celsius. So if that we started off already cold, and if you walked in the uh, period room, a uh, pre-op room, it might be cold too, right? So if the patient's already started hypothermic, it's not a good start. So and pre-op warming is you know recommended, and a uh, patient can be starting off the right foot. Another risk factor is general and regional anesthesia, uh, go, undergoing both combined anesthesia at higher risk. Low BMI, major to intermediate surgery, so longer the surgery or higher the risk, and at risk for CV complications. Okay, so we talked about the uh, physiology of hypothermia and thermal regulation and stuff like that, but why is hypothermia bad? So let's talk about that. So this always pops up, why hypothermia is bad. You need to know why hypothermia is detrimental to our patient population because it increases the surgical site infection rate, decreases the blood flow and oxygen delivery to the tissue, and hypothermia reduces the uh, superoxide reticle production, causing increased rate of infection. Another thing that you need to know is drug metabolism. That is so, so important to us, right? In the PACU, a tissue solubility of volatile anesthetic increases, meaning you go patient's gonna wake up much, much slower because the patient's gonna hold on to those volatile anesthetics. In addition to volatile anesthetics, often the patient receives some opiates, right? That gets held on to. So it gets really slow to be released and get eliminated. So your patient's gonna be sleep much longer, increase, your PACU length of stay. You don't want that, right? And a complication related to those anesthetics and opiates. And hepatic metabolism reduced the prolonged action of propofol and opiates. And a longer action of neuromuscular blockades causing an airway complication. Now the consequence of an unplanned hypothermia. Increased bleeding, why? due to the impaired platelet function and impaired coagulation cascade and needing the increased need for blood transfusion. And we talked about the blood transfusion, why it's bad and the consequences of complications from a blood transfusion. And the patient overall don't do so well after transfusion anyway. So we want to avoid it if all possible, uh, but it can increase the risk for bleeding. Another thing is increase the risk for cardiac events. The patients are three times likely to experience MI if patients suffered unplanned hypothermia. It increased the cardiac workload from increased post-op catecholamine concentration and the increased muscle, skeletal muscle oxygen demand from shivering and it causes vasoconstriction, right? So patients likely to suffer MI after uh, hypothermia. Another thing, it causes shivering. 
Why is shivering bad? It increases the carbon dioxide production and a catecholamine release and increased cardiac output. We already talked about the work, increasing the workload on the heart. We don't want to close it. We want to optimize the care, right? So we don't want the patient to shiver. It increases the post of pain and makes monitoring unreliable. You've probably seen shivering patient and you're trying to monitor the ECG rhythm or pulse ox and you just don't see any waveform because the patient's shivering. And we might delay care if we cannot identify the correct rhythm or look at the ultrasound correctly. Overall, all of this would put an increased cost, increased length of stay, delayed discharge from PACU, and increased complication like your bleeding, infection, and mind altered drug metabolism, pressure injury, and stuff like that. So what do we do to monitor and how do we intervene? We don't want any of that complications we just talked about, right? We don't want any of those negative consequences in your patient. So what can we do about it? So we're going to monitor the patient. Hopefully you are monitoring the patient's vital sign and temperature uh, closely. But here are the other signs of symptoms you should look out for. Early signs of symptom of hypothermia, tachypnea, tachycardia, hyperventilation, impaired judgment, shivering, taxia, and chordiasis and stuff like that. But hopefully you don't ever, ever, ever see late signs of symptoms. And um, usually you don't see that in air conditioned hospital room. Uh, usually these are the signs of symptoms you're going to see in the patient who fell into like a frozen lake and stuff like that, like a radiarrhythmia, you know, depression, coma, hypotension, and asystole and ventricular arrhythmia. So what should we be doing about monitoring the temperature? The practice recommendation is we should be monitoring the patient temperature constantly and using the same method to measure the temperature, starting from pre-op or to pack you. So we should not be using DEFEN method, right? So the pre-op, uh, they should not be using, like let's say they use an, a temperature, oral temperature, and then or they use esophageal temperature and pack you, we use temporal. That's not reliable, right? Because it's a DEFEN method. So we want to make sure we use the same temperature measuring method. and. The image shown here is a 3M spot on, and they can put that little sticker on the forehead in the pre-op, and uh, we can use the same method throughout in the pre-op or pack here, so we we'll be using the same temperature measuring method. What does the skip measure say about it? And skip measure says we should be using the active warming method for temperature less than 36 degrees and to maintain the temperature greater than 36 degrees Celsius or 96.8 degree Fahrenheit. And to measure the temperature at least at those points, 30 minutes prior to surgery, so that's in your pre-op, right? And 15 minutes immediately after anesthesia end time, so that's in PACU. And to achieve the core temperature greater than 36 degrees Celsius. And if we don't achieve that, we need to be using active warming method to achieve that uh, temperature. Of course, the intentional hypothermia patient for, for your like CV patients are excluded from this GIP measure. So what are the interventions we can do to warm up the patient? If the patient is hypothermic, we should just not be using passive warming a method. For example, if you're just using warm cotton blankets, that's not enough. It's not going to warm up warm the patient if effectively. We should be using both active and passive warming interventions to warm the patient up. So what are the active warming methods? That's your forced, forced warming device like bear paws, bear huggers, and something to get the warm air circulating. And circulating water mattresses, heating blankets, uh, radiant warmers for your babies, and warm humidified inspired oxygen can be used for active warming. But passive warming, you're probably aware of, like, you know, you can put socks on, put a head covering on the patient, or especially like the babies, right? And limit skin exposure and put the warm, nice cotton blanket that came right out of the dryer. It feels nice. But those things cool down so fast. That's why you should not be using this just to warm up the patient. You should be using both active and passive warming methods. And oxygen should be applied to the patient, especially the shivering patient because of the increased oxygen demand. And a small dose of a meperidine can be used to decrease shivering. So we used to use meperidine for pain, but we use meperidine 
for shivering. So we might be using like 12.5 milligram or up to 25 milligram of mepiridine to control shivering. But be careful when you're warming up the patient. You do not want to rapidly warm up the patient. Why? Because it causes vasodilation. And the patient is you already vasodilated from anesthetics. And if you rapidly warm up the patient, can be massively vasodilated this patient, and you're going to see a massive hypotension. You don't want that. And it causes the fluid to shift, and it might even cause burn. So with the intervention, you need to make sure you document the, all the hard work you've done, right? So temperature should be documented at the mission at least every 15 minutes if active warming is used. If you do use continuous warming method, do document them frequently if you can, or hourly if the patient is normal thermic and you're just waiting for bed or whatnot, you can be done hourly or every uh, few hours, depending on what the floor protocols are, then before discharge. But before discharge, make sure the patient's temperature is at least 36 degrees uh, Celsius or 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit and what warming methods you used and make sure you assess the skin on initiation and uh, throughout the therapy and then after the completion of warming therapy make sure you assess and document that. So to summarize why do we need to avoid hypothermia again? because it causes shorter packing length of stay, right? You wanna make sure you move the patient efficiently and optimize the patient throughput. Reduce cost. Decrease ICU emissions because the decreased uh, risks of MI and bleeding and all that stuff, right? And decrease overall length of stay, reduction of MI, reduction of the need for mechanical ventilation, reduce surgical site infection, and reduce overall mortality. That's why we want to avoid hypothermia. Hypothermia puts patient at risk for no reason, right? So make sure you using that um, evidence-based method to measure the temperature. And if you're using temporal thermometer and don't try to aim for the magic number so I can discharge my patient. If you have to swipe more than twice, you are probably hypothermic anyways, warm up the patient. So we can achieve the normal thermia in the patient. Here are my references and thank you for listening.